All right, well, uh, we're back um, with another, I guess, installation. Uh, you know, today it's still me and David. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm studying clinical psychology and David, if you want to introduce yourself. Yo, hello everyone, David. I studied uh, government, political science, whatever. It was, it's a fake degree. So whatever I study doesn't really matter. But yeah, that's what I'm, that's my uh, area of quote unquote expertise. Cool. And so, you know, obviously there's a lot of big stuff going on in the past week or two. Um, most notably, Wait, the, there well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I guess it's big depending on who you are. Uh, <laughs> Um, Big. You, Adam, it sounds like you're saying somebody got shot. Come on. It well, be that big of a deal. No, no. Well, you know, funny enough, uh, Donald Trump, the former president of the United States, um, there was an uh, attempted assassination at one of his what, Pennsylvania rallies. And there's sort of been like a, an explosion on the Internet uh, <laughs> as a result. A, a little bit. Yeah. People have lost their minds in both directions. Um some people are celebrating. Some people are pearl clutching. Some people think that uh, rhetoric got us in this place. Some people don't. You know, there's there's a lot of everybody has a theory as to why we're in the boat we're in. Um, I don't think from what I've heard, many of them are too on the nose, um, but we're going to kind of, you know, we're. I think that's what we're planning to explore here today is as just uh, whether political violence is an effective tool, whether it should always be avoided, whether it supports democracy, hampers democracy, whether it should be something that exists in a free society, whether it's, you know, it just kind of uh, the different mechanisms, you know, what are the implications, uh, you know, that, uh, just sort of, I don't know, just sort of all the different threads that are associated with something like an assassination. But uh, yeah, I, and David, I think you have you've kind of worked out in some arguments for uh, what you think is like the best way of handling political violence. I don't know if you want to share that now we can kind of riff, riff on them as, as we go, as you share kind of interject. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the first thing I would say, and also I didn't want to just as a preemption, um, you know, I'm, we're going to be talking a lot about the people who uh, seemed to celebrate a little bit about the attempt and maybe wish that the wind had blown it a few inches to the right. Um, I don't think that that is a majority of Democrats by any means. I don't know of any polls asking that question, mm -hmm. but this that even that group of people um, is at a very, very small fringe minority who's probably overrepresented on a Twitter or, or X. Yeah. X, so, yeah. Yep. But I still want to make a bit of a steel man of the case that they're making before explaining why I think that that's probably not good. So I think that we'd probably agree, this might be controversial, but um, the guy who tried to overturn a free and fair election might be a small threat to uh, a democratic society. Would you agree with that one? Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> I think even yeah. devoid of the rhetoric and way you describe him, just d just laying out the plain, the facts of Jan six and all that stuff. I think that that, yeah, I think that that puts a little bit of a red flag in people's mind. Yep. I'm even fine to go and give the best case for, uh, why he's not actually an authoritarian. Maybe he's so crazy. He actually believes his shit, but that doesn't really change the fact. Like, it's kind of like whether a guy's coming at you with a knife because he wants to kill you or because he's crazy. Hey, he's coming at you with a knife. That's kind of how I look at it. And there is actually an argument that can be made that says, hey, this person is a pretty unique threat to our society and to our democracy. And if he comes into power, he could damage our democratic institutions so severely this time now that he has more political experience, he has more loyal followers, more yes men surrounding him, that taking him out would have actually been the best thing for our society. Yeah, it could cause more polarization. Some people will get mad, maybe even a few terrorist attacks. But all of the harm that could have been done by his presidency would be mitigated. Potential institutional collapse, maybe irresponsible wars, all of it. That, I'm going to be honest, in isolation, that is actually kind of persuasive from a utilitarian calculation. Would you agree or no? Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely he hear that argument. And yeah, I mean, I, I can see where some people would reach that conclusion. Um, I have a hard time buying it personally, but like I, I can see I, I, I can see where some people would get that idea, basically. And like, 
I, I hate using Hitler as an analogy because I don't think that Trump is Hitler. Um, right. I, mm-hmm. I think like there's there's a very big scale of badness, and I don't think that he's in that same league. Right, right. But that's like the most Americans know about Hitler. Maybe if you're like in the top twenty percent of political education, you know about Stalin. That's the mm-hmm. extent of the average yeah. person's knowledge of, right. uh, of like historical dictators. Right. Like you could probably argue, hey, if somebody in 1928 went up to Hitler and shot him, that would probably have been good for the world. Like, yeah, murder's bad, but man, he was a really bad dude, and he did a lot of bad things, and making sure he didn't become chancellor, and then Fuhrer. Probably, I, I'll be honest. Yeah, I think that that would have been good. It would have been good to do that. Would you agree with that one? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, divorcing it from the t- like Donald Trump does help me like buy it more, basically. But like, I, I agree with your like badness scale. Like, it's so hard. You know, I, like I don't want to dilute the badness scale because there are some bad people where you know the really bad end of the badness scale is sort of reserved for. And Donald Trump is. Pretty bad dude, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, like, I, I, I could say maybe within the Mussolini territory. If Mussolini was like the Yankees of badness, I could say that Trump would be like the Mets. Yeah. But I don't think I could do uh, Hitler. I think I'd, I'd probably have to still say no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that is a actually convincing argument, but there's a really big problem with it that I think that anybody making it really has to address. So here, do you want the... How um how pretentiously philosophical should we get with this one? Uh, we'll go sixty percent. I, okay. I do Perfect. I do like more than more. I do like more pretension than less. But I understand that like some people kind of are off put by it. Me personally, I go a hundred percent, but we'll go sixty percent. Okay, perfect. So. That's perfect. We'll just go with the cliff notes of Carl Schmidt, which is great, because that way I don't get in any trouble for misrepresenting him. So (laughs) Carl Schmidt was a pretty one of the most influential political theorists of the 20th century. Uh, He had a lot of very, very powerful ideas that uh, basically just about every major political theorist who thinks about like systems of government has had to contend with. There's a few things about Carl Schmidt that people find a little heckin' problematic, um, like being an unrepentant Nazi. That was a really big one. Yeah. Um, you could probably see how that might like leave a bad taste in people's mouth, right? Yeah, yeah, I can see how that would affect yeah. people's impression of him for sure. <laughs> yeah, but um, but he actually, I'll put it this way: uh, I think most people would say Carl Schmidt did a really good job of diagnosing a lot of the problems within a democracy, but he had a horrible cure. You know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. just horrible cure. And so one of his really big ideas was this idea. It's called the friend enemy distinction, and it's actually kind of simple it's basically this idea that politics is just about friends and enemies uh coalition you have coalitions your coalition is your friends and then you have adversaries those are your enemies and all what politics is really about is about this battle between your coalition and your enemy coalition it's kind of obvious in a democracy because especially a two-party system we have the Democrats and the Republican. You can kind of see it's pretty obvious, right? Right, right. But even within authoritarian regimes, this is still pretty much the the case with them as well. Like, you have the king's court. Well, you know, have you ever heard that term, like, court politics? Yeah. That's basically just talking about the friend-enemy distinction in a lot of ways. Is There are different coalitions around the king or the queen, and... Uh, they are vying for the king's power, for the king's attention, to get the king to do what they want. And they're often competing with each other, sometimes to the point where it can be violent. And he thought that democracies were always going to be doomed to fail, uh, mostly because he thought the friend-enemy distinction would make it so that politics will be unworkable within a democratic system, because everybody's eventually going to hate each other, they're going to be at each other's throats, they're going to kill each other, all these things. And his solution was, oh, what if we just unite the whole nation as the friend headed by the Fuhrer and the enemy's just the outside people. Yeah. So that was kind of his solution. Not great, but he did diagnose a problem. The thing that I think he got wrong, though, was that friends and enemies might be a universal part of democratic politics, mm. but enemy's a bit strong of a word. I think what can happen is you can have the friend-opponent distinction, or maybe the teammate-opponent distinction. Mm. 
and I'm going to steal this one from a guy named Vlad Vexler. I'm almost done, I promise. I'm almost done. But the Vlad Vexler, he's a really interesting poly- or, uh, philosopher. Everybody should look him up on YouTube. And the way he puts it like this is like this. A democratic society needs to be like a good game of tennis, where I might be on one side and you're on the other side. And we're competing with each other, but we're competing under a sense of fair play, a sense of rules, and we're not enemies. We're cooperating to compete. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Sort of like iron sharpens iron kind of thing where it's like uh, there's like a competitive spirit between two sort of friendly ish people or friends. Yeah. Like, I mean, if we went to play now, granted, we probably wouldn't be playing tennis because we're, we're nerds. But sure. if we we're playing... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, we were playing, you know, League of Legends. I never liked it because I sucked at it, but we were playing League of Legends. Um, the reason we're playing games together is because we want to keep playing the game over and over and over again. I might win some, you might win some, but we play fair because we want to keep playing the game. Right. And playing the game over and over is the important part. The problem is that when you get to a degree of polarization, that it stops being teammates and opponents. And that's when you get to the friend versus enemy. And the metaphor would be like if I came across to your side of the court and started smacking you in the head with a tennis racket. At that point, we're not opponent. That's when we become the enemies. Mm. And the problem with political violence is that political violence is the ultimate form of enemy, not the ultimate as opposed to opponent. Right. Once you get to that moment where you're saying, yeah, from well, I'm making the utilitarian calculation that it's better to kill my political opponent, that's when you fully start to embrace the politics of enemies versus the politics of opponents. Mm. Once you embrace that, you start to lose everything. Right. Now it starts to become, I'm going to assassinate him because I've made the utilitarian calculus. Well, what happens when the other guy makes the opposite calculus and your type needs to die? That's why we can never, as Vlad Flex would put it, there's no liberatory potential for political violence within a mm. democracy. What do you think of that one? Yeah, I can understand that. Like in terms of games, you need to have the moves in each game have to be sustainable and re- re- repeatable. Otherwise, uh, the game terminates itself you know what i mean like uh so like a game in which you so like if you're playing chess if you light a stick of dynamite on the chessboard every time someone moves their knight to g3 the game is over every time a knight moves on g3 so it's like every time the other political party does something that you don't like or whatever it is every time they move their you know you know every time they uh go to repeal abortion or whatever instead of like going through the courts and like, uh, you know, uh, mobilizing and getting folks together to vote, et cetera, et cetera. You go and light something on fire or whatever, blow something up. It's like, <laughs> it's a race to the bottom. You know, there's not, there's no room to keep playing a game like that. You, you, you there's not enough chess boards if you keep blowing them up, you know what I mean? Like for everyone to keep playing chess. So, um, yeah, yeah I totally, I, to- I totally, uh, I can totally, s- uh, buy that argument. Yeah, so I yeah, so I think that what the big problem right now when it comes to political stability is that we are moving in we are just constantly moving towards the enemy rather than the opponent when it comes to dealing with our adversaries, right? And I'm also I'm let's let's I'm not gonna mince words. This is not both sides. Uh only one presidential candidate has made multiple jokes about their political opponent being assassinated, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's just it's just kind of like anybody who would disagree with a statement that Trump and that type of movement has been more detrimental to our political stability is either very very ignorant or very very partisan in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all the stuff he said about Hillary Clinton and all that. Like, I mean, like, uh, yeah. I <laughs> it seems obvious that there is that it's a sort of a one sided approach, like. Biden saying like Donald Trump needs to be in the bullseye or whatever he said, crosshairs, like in a private phone call, by the way, too. This is even a private phone call. Yeah. To to think that they're at all similar or equivalent exchanges. It's like, uh, no, no, sorry. (laughs) It seems insane. Yeah. It's all. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, fight like hell doesn't mean fight like hell, then bullseye, Donald Trump in the bullseye doesn't mean go shoot Donald Trump or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. Especially like it's 
the I'll put this one of the things that I've really really started to embrace more is the idea of I guess you call it coalitional psychology mm. kind of that you know as part of our species is that we our brain are designed for tribes of 50 or 100 people living in the wood uh, and occasionally having to fight other tribes uh, not necessarily that often but occasionally have to fight other tribes and also coalitional coalitions within our tribe we have this coalition brain i think Mm -hmm. that once we latch on to a coalition and we really feel that it's important on some personal and social level it just melt our capacity to think in a unbiased manner does that make sense yeah yeah it we 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 get uh, it's kind of like what we talked about last uh week actually you know like the bind and blind you know what i mean as soon as we're as soon as we have our in-group buddies, it's sort of like it's impossible for them to do any wrong, essentially. And and, and it's so easy, even the minus, minor, the most minor transgression uh, from the out-group, uh, you know, uh, sets us off. Yeah, yeah, I think. And um, if we think, like, I know somebody who is conservative, they aren't going to vote for Trump. They, they've decided not to. But they are still, I can just see there's a lot of uh, psychological blocks they have to being fully upfront about certain things mm-hmm. and this is just an example this is not a stupid person by the way this is a person who i think is you know if you give them an iq test they're going to do pretty damn well on it right right i've been able to talk to them and get them to admit that donald trump did try to overturn a free and fair election right mm-hmm. i cannot get them to admit that that person is a serious threat to democracy wow yeah and I, the I, reason oh sorry sorry what I, did I say? well i i think part partly the reason why most people can't seem to comprehend that type of threat is it's like it's just so outside of the norm for like the past 50 years basically <laughs> like it's just like it's just like so there's no unprecedented there's no yeah there's no there's no anchoring point in reality. It's like, if I said, if this guy, if, 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 uh, if you light a candle and you leave it unattended, your house is going to catch on fire. Like that would pretty much, you would, you would blow out the candles before you leave the house, but it, there's not the same correlate for like democracies at stake or, you know, rights of, uh, protected people is are at stake or whatever it is. Like, it, d- yeah. <laughs> America it's, itself is at stake. Like there, there is an existential threat here. Like that doesn't, it just doesn't register. It's just like, there's no, there's just no referent. There's nothing for people to, uh, like, there's no way for people to uh, comprehend it. It's like, it's like, it's like thinking of a billion sands of, gra- uh, uh, grains of sand or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just like, there's no, yeah. there's no way to comprehend it. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, continue. Um, you weren't able to convince them that that person's a threat to democracy, but you can convince them all the other facts of the matter. Yeah, there's certain connections that don't want to be made, even though it's the logical conclusion of these disparate and separate beliefs. Once mm-hmm. you string together, there's like one logical... Oh, hello? Hello? Hello. Yep, sorry, I think that was me. Where? Mm-hmm. What was the last thing I had been saying? I can go back and... Mm. There's a, once you put the pieces together, there's a logical connection. Yeah, yeah. So I can give them premise, 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 and all three of these premises naturally lead to the conclusion. They agree with all the premises, but that that conclusion, that final biting the bullet conclusion is can't get over that hill. And mm-hmm. I think that one of the big problems we have is we assume that this is because people are stupid and uninformed. And that's part of it. What you're saying about having no frame of reference, that's a big part of it. I can point to Turkey and Hungary and say, oh, things can go bad like that. That's Mm -hmm. what we're risking right now. And they don't have a frame of reference for it because nobody in America knows, but people don't know what Turkey is. Right. It's It's the thing we eat on Thanksgiving, you know. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. But I think there's even something else is that our coalitional psychology really makes it so that we want to feel like, one, we're part of that group, that we have a sense of belonging within it. And then two, that that group is good. There's there's something good about this group that makes us better than our opponents because we have to justify being opponents, right? Right. And I think that the big problem we have isn't that 
they, like there's no video you're gonna sit most people down and just convince them to believe all the things that I think are true about the world if they don't want it. it it's kind of that that famous thing. Um, it's hard to make a man believe something if his paycheck depends on it not being true. Right. And I think that there's this very strong sense right now that because of the degree of polarization, it has become rational to deny very obvious things about reality. Because rationality is not about truth. Rationality is about solving a problem. Right. And if the truth is adding to a problem, then the rational thing to do is if you can find a way, if you can find a way to make it so that that you don't have to accept it, that's the rational thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you in that front. I, and like, I think that even beyond the rationality of the situation, there's like, there's also like emotive reasons that people have, you know what I mean? Like it, it feels bad to, you know what I mean? Like you, people have a certain way of viewing themselves um, uh, that, 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 that's generally like, first, so like, even if you have like a very negative self you know, perception, like even if you have like low self-esteem and you like think poorly about yourself and you like, I I'm worthless, I'm pathetic, I, you know, I'm ugly, whatever it is. Uh, y there's still some other, some other like untapped part that just like, but I'm not that bad, but I'm not them, but I'm not, you know, whatever. And it's like, and then there's some sort of like, like visceral emo emotional component to it as well, which is like, no, I would never, I, some part of me like aesthetically likes America or whatever. Like I, I like the, I like the notion of America, or at least I think I do. I like the notion that's in my head of America. Maybe I don't like, I don't like America itself for, for whatever reason, but I think I like it. And like, it would hurt me to think that I would support someone that wants to destroy it. You know what I mean? And so it's like, there's some sort of like failure to recognize um, purely because, you know, feels bad basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But and I, the thing is, I, I, maybe this is radical. I think that that is completely rational. I well, think that's yeah, an I entirely guess. rational thing to do because what that's your goal. You don't want to feel like shit. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to this is like one area of politics where I think that this is super clear on is a lot of the crazy views on racial politics uh, on both sides of the spectrum. I think that a lot of the resistance to addressing certain elements where the progressives have a point about racism in America actually comes from conservatives they really do like america and they don't like the idea that america is still super super racist and it's um, it, like it hurts to acknowledge that there are still these actual severe problems that are that that holds america back from what it could be it's better to think of america as having solved it than to have to swallow that painful pill that we have that we haven't yet solved all these problems and then same thing on the inverse where there's a kind of a lot of, I would say, paternalistic views towards minorities among progressives, to say the least. It's, yeah. um, uh, uh, let's not, I, I don't want to necessarily get too spicy because I don't want to lose my job, but, uh, right. But there's a lot of condescending paternalistic views that I think progressives mm -hmm. have about minorities and their agency mm -hmm. because they, it's always like if you care about a group, you might prefer to see them as being 100% victim uh, than to ever acknowledge that there's agency that might be being used in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. And, and even you, you can even support it with all the other, um, like, uh, uh, arguments of infrastructure and all the societal arguments, like agency is influenced in, in every way. So it's like, you don't even have to go so far as to say, it's like, you know, like, I don't even know what you would say. Like it, it's, uh, you know, like if, <laughs> it's their fault for whatever's going on. It's their fault that their college admissions are low because, you know, whatever they choose X, Y, Z lifestyle. It's like, well, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why that might be the case, you know, like some obviously could be, uh, uh, because of explicit choices based on individuals, but they're, they could, they're also system, uh, systematic reasons for, uh, problems with agency and things like that, you know, like, uh, and so, but, but, but being able to address agency through the lens of, uh, systems and whatnot, like it doesn't even occur because, it feels wrong to think that any anyone's problem could be their own fault, basically, especially if like a large like, you you, you know, 80 percent of their problems, probably systematic, 20 percent, maybe personal choice. It's like we don't want to recognize the 20 percent because we believe that 80 percent 
can cover the whole bill basically. And so you miss substantive analysis on, on things. And, and, and as a result, you fail to like think creatively about solutions that could fix the problem. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. Well, I think where that comes in is going into that thinking when you have, like, I'm thinking with my coalition brain, Mm -hmm. when it's your coalition, the problems are mostly sociological. When right. It's the outside coalition, they're pathological. Yeah, yeah. Like, because it is. I actually, I do agree that a lot of this is um very much like like it's the causes of a lot of these problems are very very sociological. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing is, is it's also probably true that the reasons why people vote for Donald Trump and don't like gay marriage are also probably mostly sociological. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Right. Right. And like if. if you randomly assign people to different like times, uh, different eras, different countries, different parts of countries. If I made a hundred copies of you, but spread them all throughout time and space, each copy is going to have totally different views because right. of how much you're influenced by your sociological views. The problem is, is that we only like that for our friends. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's, it's emotionally appealing. Exactly. Yeah. It's so great to think, you know, I'm broke and I'm, I've got a bad life because, uh, I grew up in a bad neighborhood and, uh, all my teachers were, uh, you know, they, they, I, I underfunded and, you know, my school was crowded and all these other things. And, and that's why I had to rob that Walmart at gunpoint or whatever. And then it's like, but when, whenever so-and-so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, whenever the cop gives me a speeding ticket, it's not because of any uh, factors outside of this guy chose to be morally unright. He chose to go out of his way to become the most evil thing in the world and to attack me personally because he himself has some sort of personal vendetta against people like me. It's like, well, okay, well, <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, it's, it's just not, it's just not how it works. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I actually think I was watching a video on um, Tolkien and kind of the philosophy of the Lord of the Rings where, oh, and spoilers, by the way, for a book that came out in, I don't know, 1950s. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you know, when he kind of talks about where Frodo fails at the end to like destroy the ring, right? Mm hmm. And he says that he does not actually view that as a moral failing because everyone has a moral limit. Mm-hmm. And, their, and Frodo was the, probably the creature on Middle Earth that had the greatest moral capacity of anyone on Middle Earth, right? Right. But he still has a moral limit. Uh, that's um, uh, Catholic um, original sin, just so everybody knows. Yes, this mm-hmm. is a Catholic book. Don't listen to the naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, uh, you know, like, because of his original sin, he still couldn't destroy the ring because he had a moral limit. I actually do like this idea of people having different moral limits, and a lot of that is going to be down to things you have no control of. If it does turn out that there are some, like, I, there has to be some degree to which your genes might predispose you to being violent, for example. Um, some people like hell if you just have high testosterone production you're probably going to be more violent if somebody who has a genetic basis for being not violent i don't think they get the moral points for being not violent that's Mm -hmm. just they had they got lucky there the problem is is that yeah nobody and then it's also okay well what if you're born in a violent culture or if you're born in a culture that doesn't have any violent you don't get those points that wasn't you that was just the luck right we only want to apply this to the friends you know Right. Not to the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's totally it. Uh, you know, and I think that like, to your point, like, I, I agree that there's probably large parts of us that are determined and th- there's always like, but you know, there's, um, I, I think of genetics as sort of like paints on a painter's palette. You know what I mean? Like there's a fixed amount of them. They're predetermined, like what, however many, like some people are born to all the colors of the rainbow. Some people can only paint in, you know, black and white or whatever. And so it's like, uh, do we really get, you know, can you, can you credit the painter who painted with a thousand colors, uh, like how bright and shiny their painting is versus the guy who is only given black, white, and gray to paint with, you know what I mean? It's like the, the, the quality and the, and the substance of the paint, like you can do a lot of amazing stuff with charcoal, black, white, color, and grays, et cetera. But like, if you judge them similarly, uh, like on the same thing, like obviously 
the person who has won the genetic lottery and was born with uh, a chroma key containing 15 billion uh, colors or whatever, like um, obviously they're going to be able to, you know, produce more colorful, more aesthetic or whatever, like painting, depending on how you judge it. And so like, similarly, the person who won the genetic lottery, won the, the location lottery, they're, they're born in a, in a, in a, like a not war torn country that like has, you know, very modern progressive values that support, you know, <laughs> support, uh, you know, progress in the future. And, and they're like very, uh, virtuous and whatever, like, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just, you can't judge the paintings the same. You know what I mean? Like you have to judge a black and white painting as a black and white painting and, and so on and so forth. It's like, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's, like, uh, it, the problem is, is like, we, we're so nearsighted and we're, we are given to all our, you know, our heuristics and our biases and all those types of things. And they cloud our judgment and they limit our ability to like comprehend those things in, in, in a true uh, light. You know what I mean? Like in, in a way where we're not like, being hijacked by that coalition brain, you know, like, uh, there, there's so many components of our biology and also just like, wolf. there's like, you know, all the, all the, uh, products of our agency are, will, our, our willful ignorance and, and our, our desire to not know certain things because of, you know, how they might impact us and, and whatnot. I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that you're exactly right. And, uh, yeah. I love the Tolkien reference. <laughs> yeah, I convinced my mom to finally um, watch uh, Lord of the Rings. So this Monday, she's going to watch Fellowship. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. She, she hasn't watched it. <laughs> yeah, well, I she never would have watched it. And then somehow I convinced her to watch Game of Thrones like five years ago and she loved it. Uh huh. That feels like, like such more a... Than my dad. Yeah, that feels like Game of Thrones is like 10 levels above... Uh, Lord of the Rings, I feel like, in terms of, like, the content that's in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's a very, like, I can totally see the influences of Tolkien on Game of Thrones, but so many of those influences are also what he's trying to not be, which right. I also don't think is bad. I don't. Uh, they're very different stories with very different purpose, so I don't think he, even he would say it's a bad thing. Um, right. One of my favorite quotes from his is, like, yeah, you know, it's all great that, uh, you know, the king, the good king comes into power and the realm is all nice and peaceful. But what was Aragorn's tax policy? Yeah, yeah. But but without getting that sidetracked. But yeah, I think that, you know, we we go back and we'll say, oh, you know, they were a man of their time. You know, we're mm -hmm. looking back at these historical figures. And it's like, that's true. Everybody's a man of their time. And everybody's a man of their where they were born at and all these other factors. And it's very difficult to get once if you can if you can turn that switch on in your brain and keep that switch flip, it is really good for your empathy. But man, that's a I will say this for myself, that's a really hard switch to flip and mm -hmm. keep on. Because like think about this. Kim Jong un, we call him like the most evil guy in the world. And his dad was the most evil guy in the world. And then his dad was the most evil guy in the world. Right. What what are the odds? What yeah. are the odds of that? Right. Maybe it's, and this is like I, you know, maybe that to say like, listen, if Kim Jong Un died today, I think that would probably be awesome for the world. But if you're gonna be consistent with this, we can say everything he's doing is horrible, and we morally condemn it, and he needs to go to prison, and he should be, you know, in the ICC and all that stuff. But man, we probably would be doing the same thing. We'd probably do the same thing if we were born where he was born. We had the mm -hmm. same education he had. We have the same incentives that he does. Because he doesn't kill people for no reason. He kills right. people because he doesn't want to lose power. Because if he loses power, him and everybody he loves are going to die. That doesn't yeah. justify it. But right. he does it for a reason. And we would probably do the same damn thing if we were in his shoes. 100%. And that's a hard thing to think about. Yeah, yeah. And that's... uh yeah uh it's uh i, I, <laughs> I mean the, the, it's just it's uh the, the moral limit there is it, it's just I, I don't even know what to say about it you know it's just it's just it's it's one of those self-evident things it's and it's so hard to recognize like and there and even no matter no like even the most saintly saint could you know couldn't uh you know w wouldn't be able to withstand like the social influences that Kim Jong-un has or that whoever, you know what I mean? Like 
the 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 guy who grows up going to clan meetings as a child or whatever you know what i mean it's like there's just not a this is not a thing that you can you can resist you know what i mean it's just like uh like i think we have like our moral agency but we it's so constrained here there's actually a good like there's very few things about this man that i will say is uh a uh, great but man karl marx had a banger quote men make their own history but they do not make it as they please mm. they do not make it under self-selected circumstances but under circumstances uh, existing already given and transmitted from the past mm. and it's like that's he's talking about you know history in this very broad sense but it's actually even on the more micro level yeah we make our choices but not in conditions of our own yeah and i think uh, i think we could transition to um I, I think that there are some people out there who uh they they've either hit their moral limit which might be generous to say uh, wh whether they were ever uh exploring the limits of the morality or not um and and they've sort of exploded off the rails uh you know like the people celebrating the death uh, that the near death of Donald Trump and uh, the death of the firefighter there and and all that the, just the whole event that transpired uh, during the assassination and thereafter. I wonder if there's there anyone after. in mind that you have when, where, where their moral <laughs> limits got hit. Yeah, any, I, I, any I, you know, figures. You know, um, I can think of one probably. Um, a there's tiny a one? a tiny one. Yeah, a gnome, uh, a gnome, a lying gnome. Yep. Um, I think that, you know, like, uh, destiny is who we're talking about. He's an influential political streamer, uh, who incurred a series of mutes, bans, demonetizations, and, uh, just a lot of, uh, negative publicity based on his viewpoints gamer that he's his, his gamer moment. Yeah. His, his, um, uh, breakdown of his mor moral limits, I guess, depending on what you think. I mean, I don't think he, I think he would, he's, I think he still does and will and always will stand by everything you said recently. Um, which is that he, uh, finds it funny that the firefighter died there. And like, th th I think the thing that, and that Donald Trump, he would lose no sleep over Donald Trump dying. And I think that like there, there is, um, there's like there's like a strong like abstract political argument you can make for violence that's sort of nebulous and like probably you know definitely logically consistent that like follows through is like very easy to support etc cetera, etc cetera. like very much like oh you know like just like Although very he did very it, just be, I don't I don't think you're saying it but just and he, he didn't justify it either. he did say <laughs> yeah it was that's false. true. That's true. So, so just yeah, yeah just just because uh, yeah, he did. He said, I think he said it's wrong, but I have no sympathy and think it's funny. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, I mean, like that stance, it's like I don't know. Like for me, I, I feel there there are plenty of things that I find that, that I don't like being made fun of or whatever. But like, I, I don't know. I I feel I feel conflicted over. A lot of his comments you know i generally i generally find him to be like very reasonable etc cetera, etc cetera. and like i said i can even buy a lot of like the, the arguments for political violence and things like that and some of the ones we've laid out here even um and uh it, it just you know i don't know there's just some i i think it's just it just feels bad i think that like op like the optics matter but I, you know i've watched a lot of his well, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Well, I was going to say it's about the, I think it moves us towards the away from, like, we're already moving that way. Don't get me wrong. But it's not getting us closer to the teammate opponent. It's getting right. us closer to the friend enemy. Right. Yeah. I think that the game is not sustainable. Like those rules of engagement. Like I don't, I also don't like the pearl clutching, like the, oh my gosh, I can't believe you oh, would say God, something yeah. like that. It's like, okay, but like the Nancy Pelosi hammer incident, I can't even express to you how many yeah. people made fun of that whole situation. The same moment that it was happening, basically. Um, and then, and then similar. Similarly with like George Floyd, Michael Brown, all these, whatever, anybody like when people die, I, I mean, I think the jokes come flying almost within hours of it happening. I, I just don't think that this is a unique situation and I don't think it's even specifically new, unique to uh, like left leaning people, you know what I mean? And so. Oh, no, no, definitely not. And I'll even say this. Now, the this only applies to Trump versus Paul Pelosi. 
uh, not the firefighter who did die, but mocking Trump's assassination, I'll be honest, I would much rather be clipped in the ear by a bullet than open the door where I'm not even fully dressed and have some crazy guy start bashing my head with a hammer. Yeah. I I, I would take that. Like, it's it sounds funnier, the second one, and this, like, very, like, if it was in, like, a movie, the second one would be, like, the funnier thing to happen. Right. But really think about, I imagine, I imagine that for Paul Pelosi, that was actually a lot worse psychologically yeah, than it was for Trump. 100%. Paul Pelosi is just a very stoic guy, you know? Sure, 100%. I mean, Donald Trump was in a public event. Like, it's not it's not his home, his private residence. It wasn't a, per, it was like a very, like, a, a person can, you can depersonalize a bullet. Like, he never saw the guy shooting at it. Like, it was like, it's just like this very... One second, he's standing there. The next second, bang, and then his ear is cut. And it's like, I don't want to diva. I've never been shot at, so I don't, I'm not going to like try and like grandstand here and say like, it's not scary at all to get shot at. But I I, I 100% would find it a lot scarier if some there was some psychopath on my front doorstep who just jumps on me and starts to attack me, basically. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. it, like yeah. it, all the associations there, like you, you have some expectation of, privacy and safety in your own home whereas like donald yeah. trump was like surrounded by armed guards you know what i mean it's like it's not like yeah. these two are not equivalent you know what i mean like yeah and it's like and you know but it's it's just like you can't say it's okay to joke about like you shouldn't joke i don't think you should probably publicly joke about either it's probably not good for social norms to be publicly joking about either. Right. But man, if you're going to say you can't joke about a guy getting clipped in the ear, but you can joke about a dude in his own home having a guy try to beat his skull in with a hammer, you're you're losing that one, you know what I mean? Right. It's like it's it's just one is worse than the other on a personal level, and right. so it's just so blatant the the hypocrisy is just so Blake. right well and like all the rhetoric it's it's like they're the they're the op they're supposed to be the opposite of the word you know sticks and stones family you know what i mean like w words are violence that was like for like 10 years that's all i ever heard was like i can't believe they're teaching in school that words are violence sometimes you got to hear hard stuff blah 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 whatever and it's like <laughs> and now and now now it's like the the most frightening thing to them like th that that's that's the part i i have a hard time with the pearl clutching bit of it like i have a, i have a problem with the jokes of course like for me i personally would never joke about someone dying like whether i hated them or not you know unless it's been like i don't know like unless it's hitler or something like that you know what i mean like unless it's like so divorced but it's just like i it's such a big event like there's so many factors that are involved and like we still don't even fully understand the ramifications of that assassination attempt um you know on on our election cycle etc like we don't we just don't know we just don't know like <laughs> what what yeah. wheels are we're, we're put in motion you know what i mean like it, it certainly seemed like the best possible and the cheapest of all marketing strategies for donald trump you know what i mean like uh that photo that photo is uh, going to be i mean it is already, that photo the photo that he took seconds after like i mean it, it just seems like it, it's just so you could like, put it in the book exactly it's like unbelievable nobody it, like this bullshit it's right bullshit. get out I, of here i felt like i was watching like a usa today like thriller sitcom or whatever uh -huh. like like burn notice or whatever and it was yeah. like this like they, they you know what i mean like donald trump was on there playing the president and then you know what i mean like one, one of their the like stuck this season exactly it's like oh my gosh like i just cannot believe how perfect that photo is how scary perfect that photo is it's like, like I, oh, I hate the man, but I gotta give him credit. Like that was an amazing photo. Yeah, he is an uh, he is an entertainer. Like I, I think that there's no foul play. I think it was a real attack, et cetera, et cetera. And and I, and I think that Donald Trump is so entertainment brained that the first thing he oh, thought yeah. of after getting shot was I gotta do a good photo op. Like literally, yeah. not I'm safe, et cetera. It's time to milk this because I'm about to. I'm about to I'm about to take this as far as I can. I couldn't have spent fifty million dollars and get the kind of publicity I'm about to get. You know what I mean? Like, it's oh, yeah. yeah. It's just it's just his. Brain. That's what he's been like. Yeah. He is first and foremost. He's not a businessman. First and foremost, he's a showman. Yeah. That is what he is. Yeah. And he's and like he is unbelievably good at being a showman. 
I yeah. hate I oh god. Okay, so um I don't know if you know this, Adam. I kind of have a burning hatred for for uh what we might call the uh the woke and progressives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I can understand that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um it's it's pretty bad, so nobody can ever tell me I am uh only dislike the right. One of the things I always hated is when I would hear a lot of very educated progressive people say how uncharismatic he is because you're just you are just revealing how detached you are from the way most people see the world. Yeah. Most people view that guy and he is just he is oozing with a certain type of charisma. Right. That a that the type of um refined uh, progressive types are not gonna like, but for normal people, man, he's just very, very, very charismatic. Right. I mean, he very clearly has a silver tongue. Like you cannot get away with the types of stuff he's gotten away with throughout his life. If you were a, if you were just a, a buffoon with no social skills, like if you were just totally socially inept, you couldn't pay off a porn star and embezzle money and be married five times. And you know what I mean? Like say all the crazy stuff to people that he said and still like, Oh yeah. He's hilarious. Like he might go now, but man, he's the guy's the guy makes me laugh sometimes. I'm not going to right, lie. Right, right, right. Like some of the stuff that he used to post on Twitter, even before he was president, like he would say just some funny things. Yeah, yeah. And so. Yeah, no, I, he's. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. He said, well, yeah, we're, we're okay. I mean, I was just going to sort of get, I want to, I, I think I kind of got how you feel about it, but I'm maybe more explicitly like, uh, do you, do you think that like destiny is what you like, would you tone police destiny? Do you think his jokes are j simply just, you know, in poor taste or they're justified? What do you think? Um, I would, the way that I would say it is this, I'm, I'm kind of, I wouldn't be like the moralizing tone police, like, oh, you're not about to say that word. I'm, a pretty you know me i am yeah yeah i have a pretty crude sense of humor right what i would say is that the problem with these types of jokes that you're making is that even though yeah you you're not saying that violence is okay and i'm fine with him not being sympathetic to the guy who got shot i'm not particularly sympathetic either uh it's just i i probably should be but i'm i'm really just not but what i would say is this is that when you make these jokes it still increases the hostility that's felt between both sides and he's completely right about the pearl clutching the double standards and the hypocrisy he's completely right it is bullshit that what i'm saying he should do is being held up to a way higher standard than people on the other side are being held up to. Yeah. But that doesn't change the fact that if we want to move between to, uh, towards teammates versus opponents instead of friends and enemies, mm -hmm. is that we have to do things like that. Yeah. Which suck. It sucks. Yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. Me personally, I think the most effective way to like combat something like this is not necessarily to like stoop to their level and start throwing mud, which I can understand. Like I get that, like the being holier than thou and like having higher standard of like communicating and like being civil and whatnot. Like I can understand that, that that's like, um, it hasn't really netted too many positives because like Donald Trump just sort of keeps, keeps, you know, keeps winning basically with the same style, like being just crude and, and, and ruthless in that way. Um, but I think that instead of like getting in the slums, I think that it's better to be like become a mirror basically is like, it's not so much that you do the same thing as them is that you, you find a way to like redirect them. It's almost like you become paternalistic towards them. Like, like I've heard him say, like, just because you're using a uh, super civil tone doesn't mean you can just sort of say the most heinous stuff. That's like the most yeah. anti-American, et cetera. Like the, the civility that's of politics and like, yeah. Yeah. And like the, for me, it's like, uh, for me, it's, for me, it makes my, 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 my skin crawl whenever I see someone like in a manicured suit saying like that, like certain groups of people aren't human or that groups of people don't deserve rights or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's like, there's like a very manicured way of speaking and presenting yourself that like makes my skin crawl almost like a very like 
It's almost like like a, a Nazi in perfect full dress uniform, like full military out, like kitted out, like there, like being very civil, very uh, uh, professional, very you know, et cetera, like using all the right uh, uh, like ad ad addressments, like everything is like perfectly to the T, polite and civil. But what they're saying is like, uh, David, you're not a human being. I, I'm going to take you to a, a chamber and execute you or whatever. And it's like, okay, I understand like revolting and like wanting to throw mud in the face of civility but you, you definitely like just come off as like i don't know just I, it just doesn't read well in my opinion doing that but for me like speaking more like taking a paternalistic approach which is like do you really think it's okay to be speaking like that like is that acceptable do you think that that's like that's an acceptable way of speaking in a, a free fair society like do you think that 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 you know what i mean and like calling to the you know sort of calling them to account for their views in a way that like requires them to sort of um, address in true and like sort of words that are true to reality. Um, and try to like, basically make them try to like own up to what they're doing. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that I'm not, I don't know how to do it is the problem. Right. Like, well, I'll say this. Do, okay, well, do you want some, at least some good news? Yeah, sure. So... Uh, there's this kind of doomerism about the rhetoric and how it feels like conservatives aren't getting punished for it. I actually don't buy that. I really genuinely do think that they have been getting punished quite severely for it. It's just that there's an equal dislike that's been happening among uh, up, up to the left. But if the conservatives were more responsible in their rhetoric, they would probably be dominating right now. Like, mm. um, a really good example, when you go and ask about the issue, uh, the general public actually seems to be quite aligned with the Republican on, uh, like, transgender issues. This is just one I know a bit about the polling for. They seem quite aligned with the Republicans on this one. Not saying that's right or wrong. It's just, that's what the polling says. But it doesn't seem like it's a winning issue. And the reason why is because I think people realize that the Republicans, when they talk about trans people... It is often coming from a place of bullying and disgust and hatred mm -hmm. and dislike and all and all these things. And people don't like that. Even yeah. if they might say, oh, I don't know how I feel about like sports or puberty blockers. And they might nominally agree on that policy, that vitriol and that anger that they see coming from the right about that topic really does draw pe or push people who otherwise would side with them away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can understand that. Like there are plenty of proper people who like just whether that regardless of the content, they like can recognize cruel speech. You know what I mean? Like they may genuinely dislike whatever minority group you know in question but uh you know they also can like recognize when people are being cruel you know what i mean like yeah and i don't think most like if you have if you're fine with bullying if you really dislike a group um mm -hmm. you're tolerant of bullying if you're pretty wary you might not hate them but you're really wary of it but you don't necessarily have to feel animosity towards a group to have certain beliefs about that group that might nominally align. Like, I'll put it this way. Um, I'm pretty radically pro-immigration, but I don't think you have to hate immigrants to be anti-immigration relative to what the current policy is. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But if you obviously hate immigrants, it's going to push away the person who doesn't hate immigrants right, don't right. believe that we, we, we should have less immigration. Like, yeah, yeah. you can have valid reasons to think that it's, like, I actually do kind of think it's pretty bad that we have, it's pretty easy to cross the border illegally. I want a lot more immigration, but I'd really prefer if it was legal, right? Right. But, you know, and I think, I think the problem is actually that the, the left is really, really, really bad at talking to people in ways that it doesn't understand. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the like places of higher education, a lot of the institutions are just so detached, like yep. um, that they just don't know how to communicate with like average Joe. Like, like they they want this like thing to be erudite and respected and like very like uh, like reserved for the elite, you know, like very like specialized and whatever like and you need to be this high to ride this ride and need to be able to understand 47 syllable words before you can like truly grasp the nature of systemic racism where it's like no you're you're like 
the, 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 I remember listening to a lecture by the director of or the writing uh, school for University of Chicago. And he's like, it doesn't, you can't, you don't blame your audience for misunderstanding your writing. That's not how it works. <laughs> you have to write better, basically. You have to write in accordance with whoever your audience is. Like, you're not writing to yourself or to whatever. You know, like, you have to write to match your audience's reading style. That's the whole goal of writing is to be read and understood. And like, you can have a big brain and you can write, uh, you know, you could write like, you could write like uh, David Foster Wallace, where like you have like sentences that last for like four pages and like nobody's reading that except for like a hundred people uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, like academic writing programs. Um, or, you know, you can write like, Donald Trump speaks, which is at like a fourth grade reading level, you know, so like in that way, yeah. the largest number of people are going to understand you. You know what I mean? Like the goal is to be understood. The goal is not to have this special knowledge no one gets. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if, if you have a good idea, a good study or a good understanding of whether immigration is good or not good for America, the worst thing you could do is dress it up in a way that nobody understands or only people on your side understand. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. I think that so this is one of the big problems I think that that the Democrats have right now is that they've won the culture war. Yeah. Um, now, that might be changing because now things we'll, we'll see how things start panning out because it seems like a lot of the wokeness is starting to recede a bit. But I think of I, I the best word I have for them is social. And these are the things that aren't the uh, your the government institutions. Right. So Hollywood. Uh, the music industry, academia, all of these, uh, you know, most media outlets, not all of them, but most media outlets. If you go and look at most of them, who are the people who are going to be dominating the, the these institutions? It's usually going to be liberals and progressives, right? Right. And the way that they dominate these institutions, one, I think it just undermines their credibility. Um, I think both in terms of like their actual performance and the way that people judge their performance, I think it's undermined. But the other problem is that it makes them come across as being much more powerful and much more extreme than the Democratic Party might be, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, 100%. It's like, um, it's just like perception versus reality. It's sort of like, I just think of that Matt Walsh clip from Joe Rogan, where like Joe Rogan's asked how many kids are getting these gender reassignment surgeries or puberty blockers or whatever it is. And he's like, mm, probably millions. And like the actual number is like 4,000. Um, yep. And uh, like, it was like a very simple, and that was right after Matt Walsh just did like a very large documentary on transness. Uh, and yep. <laughs> he just like, he has no idea about any of it. Right. He just like laughably doesn't know. It's not even like he was like in the ballpark. He was like orders of magnitude off from understanding the reality of the situation. And the same thing is true for like, if you were to like poll people, like I would bet that they think that like half of the sitting Congress people that are registered Democrats are like, think whatever the most extreme far left, they, they, they like, they probably think that they're like, they want like, uh, they want to like bring about the Soviet revolution in America or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't even know, yeah. like, they, they, whatever the most extreme far left thing is, that's what they think at least half of Democrats think, I would guess. And it's like, couldn't be yeah. further from the truth where it's like most people are like pretty close to the center, like the vast majority. Yeah, I think the Democratic Party is a lot less extreme than it comes across as just because of that. And one other really big thing that is, I think, super important about this too is, um, God, I can't remember the full quote, but you might like the human mind is really good at certain things and not good at other things. Mm -hmm. A normal person cannot figure out on their own what the proper tax policy should be because right. that's really complicated. The you can't the normal person can't just intuitively figure out um, how to get fix homeless like like uh, mentally ill homeless people harassing people on the streets. You can't intuit that, right? Right. One thing people can really intuit really well is status social signals and how people view them and people are really 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 good at knowing when people look down on them yeah and I yeah think oh that's yeah a really big problem that the democrats have it is very obvious 
yeah. that a lot of Democrats look down on people. Yeah. Um, and they in and I think this is more of a problem in the social institutions than the political ones. Yeah. But nobody is gonna vote for the guy who who they think views them as a degenerate just because maybe that guy will also give them a handout. You know what I mean? Right. It's just no, people care a lot more about dignity than they care about any of the other things like economic stuff. People would much rather feel dignified and poor than get a then say hey you're a degenerate but here's five thousand dollars for voting for me yeah well and, and i think that to your point like the, the, it's just like it's just sort of like a long strand standing tradition of like educated liberals who now dominate universities uh discriminating like I, that's a strong word to use i don't know if i want to use discriminate but like um, oh, I'll go further. I'll say they they engage in structural discrimination. Okay. I mean, do you, uh, first let me. I'll I'll speak to my point, oh, and yeah, then yeah, we'll, no, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah, go yeah. that yeah, we'll yeah. go we'll go that route because I am interested in that. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, that I like want to encourage you be bold. Yeah, like the most common uh, trope is like the uneducated hick, uh, who is also commonly associated with the right and even far right political leanings. So like the guy who has like a strong Kentucky accent or whatever, uh, he has, he has so many negative stereotypes about him in media and, in, in art culture, et cetera, that like, he has to like overcome so much. Like, why would he do that when there's this, like, there's this other party waiting and willing to just accept him as he is basically like, he just sort of gets thrusted into it by dint of the way he speaks or, uh, the way he dresses or the types of uh, 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 social, you know, watering holes he gathers around, basically, like the types of places he frequ uh, frequents, you know what I mean? It's like, just, it, it's sort of those social factors that lean into it, you know what I mean? And it's like, there's not a lot of like, I don't think that there are any Democrats that would refrain from making, oh, okay, no, this is my, buy. I've just broken my brain, actually. I think that there's the perception that there are no Democrats that would um, be open to listening to, uh, some guy from, you know, way down South who has the strongest Southern draw, like that wears overalls to work and, you know, works in a mechanic shop or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like that there's so many yeah. negative associations that we, we fail to recognize because it's easy to not recognize them. And it's cringe to, I find it cringe to say any, like that, that guy is being discriminated against or whatever, because those words have all these other associations, which uh, speaks to the problem with our lexicon as well. Like, I think that we speak two different. Well, we morally load. We, we exactly. morally load descriptive terms. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we speak two different languages, essentially. Like the, the guy from down south speaks a different language than the New York liberal that, you know, has two master's degrees, one in HR and the other in gender studies or whatever. Like, it's like. That oh, that, yeah. per, that person speaks every word means something different to that person than than the guy oh, down south oh, working in a mechanic shop. <laughs> every single example. word. If somebody says the word equity, I feel like I know just about ninety percent of the things I need to know about them. And yeah. Unless they're talking about financial markets. Exactly. Talking about that, but otherwise, if they're talking about equity, like the moment I hear that, I'm like, okay, I know just about everything I need to know about you. Yeah. In terms of like. Like a lot of your worldview, obviously. Yeah, I don't yeah. know about like your hobbies or whatever, but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, those those markers, there are words that just carry so much weight, so much water. It's just like as soon as you use it, that's like it, that pulls in your entire archetype. That like that like is like tied to so much about you. It's like it's impossible for me to overlook. You know. Um, yeah, and so if you have a if you have an ad running for uh you know a campaign where you're running it and you say the word equity, mm -hmm. I would imagine that most of those, like if you're trying to win over some uh, lower class rural people, mm -hmm. they're going to see that even if they're talking about equity and part of that is financial equity and part of that is making sure that rural people get more handouts. Got it. I, oh, I hate rural handouts. That's <laughs> other topic though. Mm -hmm. They're going to hear the word equity. And if they're going to have that, they're going to go, oh, this is a progressive person. They look down on me. I don't like mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And, Those are, you know, and, snap judgments, automatic assumptions, all that Yeah, plays into it. But yeah, keep going. Yep. Yeah. And so, oh man. well, actually, that might be that. I think that was just really all I had to add just about that, mm -hmm. that language, the language game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, uh, you mentioned that you had something further to say about structural discrimination against, you know, rural folks or, uh, basically 
I would put it this way. Um, there's structural discrimination against people who are outside of the progressive coalition within, like, academia. Mm. Uh, I would say that at this point, now, uh, I'm not going to be able to rely on a ton of research that I can pull off of this. I probably could find, I know there's at least a few research papers I could find that would support this, but a lot of social science is fake, so I'd be a hypocrite <laughs> if I said that that proves my argument. Um, but no, I would say that there are probably two things that would be important. One of it is just going to be uh, interpersonal discrimination. And this mm -hmm. isn't necessarily as morally loaded as, say, uh, screaming against people for uh, innate characteristics, because at least you have a degree of choice about your right. coalition, right? Right. Uh, but if you obviously send out signals that I'm a right-wing conservative, people within academia uh, are going to not want to associate. That's a very, very, very obvious thing. And I know this from, one, just being around a lot of these people who are elites and seeing the way that they talk. It's very... Like, I've even kind of run little experiments to see what crazy shit can I get people to say about rural right-wing people. Oh, my God, yeah. Classroom, and they will go crazy. A hundred percent. Wow, this is wild. Yeah. I, uh, I had I had a professor say, like, um, now, Tucker Carlson is a pundit, et cetera, whatever. But he was, like, openly in a biology class was like, God, I hope no one here watches Tucker Carlson or something like, you know what I mean, to that oh, effect. Yeah, I'm yeah. like... And that's the professor, like not even a kid that I, another student that was riled up or whatever, which I mean, there was no shortage of those in many of my psychology classes. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's just, it's, it's just hard to believe that, 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 that level of disdain, open disdain is just totally acceptable. Yep. And then, so, and this can be this interpersonal um, dislike, discrimination, whatever we want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you very much sense it. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, progressives don't need to actually implement speech codes um, on universities is because they can socially sanction it perfectly fine to make it all disappear. Yeah. You don't have to worry about people making any arguments that, even if they're intellectually compelling, are very uncomfortable to a progressive because wh why? There's no point of doing it. Yeah. Um, it's just not worth dealing with the bullshit. So then you've got then what we could can look at as more of the structural factors where a lot of this, even if a person isn't explicitly discriminated against, uh, think about it like this. If most researchers, this is most, mostly going to be true in the social sciences and humanities, if most of them are left wing, they're probably going to have a lot more left wing research influence. And so say you want to get an advisor and you're a conservative minded person, what are your options? You can either hide some of your views or just pick a research topic that doesn't at all convey them. Or you can just say, okay, well, I guess academia is not for me because I don't have somebody who's going to look into my research topics that will be a good advisor for me. There are options. I'm not going to say there's none. But, you know, that's the whole point of structural discrimination is it doesn't have to be a total blocking of people. It can just be that all of these incentives add up to an environment that is unwelcoming to a certain type of person. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, 100 percent. It reminds me of uh, Eric Fromm, who is like an old psychologist, spoke about this thing called it's basically been supplanted by a lot of like sociology and stuff. But like he called it anonymous authority, which is like. It's like, it's like the specter of public dissent. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh yeah. It, it, and it, it's like pervasive in the sense that like, if I wanted to go outside and rub uh whipped cream all over my body uh, in a public park or whatever, like that there, there's not, there's not like necessarily a law that keeps me from doing it, but there's like this weird, there's this pressure, this, this societal or social pressure to like act within the confines of social norms and not be a weirdo and rub whip cream over my fully clothed body or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just like, uh, it's just not a thing that you can do. Like there are other factors that contribute to it, but like the, the pressure to, uh, you know, it, uh, to, to, to act in line with societal norms, et cetera, you know, uh, it, it, it manifests in a lot of different ways like that, you know, like in, in, in terms of how people engage with society. And, and I think it even speaks to, uh, you've mentioned before preference falsification, um, yep. you know, the notion that people just will falsify their beliefs, uh, given like maybe the nature of the, the, what the, what the group seems to be publicly displaying as acceptable beliefs or preferences, you know, so like, um, if I were in a, in a group of people who hated Italian subs, 
And I, it, it, you know, truly my favorite sandwich in the world is a chopped Italian sub. Uh, you know, but I, I know that people not only, not only are people like made fun of, but like it might impact my career if they find out that I like, uh, at chopped Italian subs, I'm not going to, the last thing I'll be telling any of the people near me uh, is that I like the thing that they all hate. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's, that's basically what's been happening with a lot of academia. And I used to be a bit optimistic about this because one of the big findings from preference to falsification is it's the cause of revolutions, right? Mm -hmm. um, the revolutions of 89 happened largely because there was this big event that revealed to a lot of people within these societies that everyone else felt the same way. I felt, I felt, oh my God, you hate these guys? You want these guys gone? So do I. And once everybody knows that they've all been lying about their preferences to stay safe, once it's once that becomes a social fact, it's a lot easier to get out there and try to overthrow a government, right? It kind of makes sense, right? Right, yeah, 100%. And I used to think that that might be, it, it wouldn't be a revolution, obviously, but something similar might happen in a university where a lot of people realize that everyone else is sick of it and they don't want to deal with all this BS and it's dumb and it's you know, it's performative, all these things. But there's one really big problem. You don't self-select into what country you're born in. If you're born in a dictatorship, that's just the luck of the draw. You self-select into whether or not you go to school. And even if people might dislike some of it and they think it's kind of silly, the people who really hate this mindset and all of these norms, they just don't go. They just mm -hmm. don't go to the universities. Yeah. And you can't, if that's what makes it so hard to have the universities reform themselves is because of the fact that that internal, that the group of people who would push for it are the people who self-select out of them. Mm. Yeah, so then the cycle yeah, repeats, I mean, and then we, you, you have two separate depictions of reality, two separate views of science, two, two separate views of yeah, everything. Like everything diverges the further apart and the less one group participates in the institutions. And uh, yeah, and, and uh and there's not a clear way to to bring one side back in after they've been alienated for so long. Yeah, that's one of the things that I'm I've been thinking a lot about how do you fix the university system and it's a it's a really rough it's really rough. It's it's a really rough one. Um and one thing that also there's one thing that I also hear brought up uh this whole like reality has a liberal bias or whatever. I'm guessing <laughs> you've heard that before. I I have heard that, yeah. I'll say this. Um, the universities have not been able to get rid of all the right-wing people, or at least the people who are willing to ask right-coded questions. Mm -hmm. There are a lot, a lot of social science findings that are not fitting well within a progressive worldview. I'll yeah. put it that way. There are some very, very, very right-wing-coded uh, facts that social science has still produced. It's just people don't talk about them much and they don't explore these topics as much because there aren't many people there. There aren't enough people interested in the topics. And for those who are, there's a lot of pressure to not do it. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it's like they may find a, a blip in their data and they're like, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's dangerous. Uh, better not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I can think. Oh, I don't know. We don't, we don't have to get into I'm it now. We could, we, we could, we could save it for another uh, episode. Actually, I think um, we've been talking for, I don't know, about an hour and 20 minutes or so. So I think we could probably wrap on this one. And then, you know, maybe next week we could talk a little bit more about how maybe the social sciences are biased or there's some of the paradoxical findings or hidden, hidden meanings of different studies and, and things like that. Oh yeah. I could definitely do that. And um and one thing I'll just say, um, just as like a wrap up note, yeah. the big problem with the area isn't that everything is wrong. It's that it's not, um, it's that there's very low credibility and there's a mm. lot of mm -hmm. You can't trust the study for a lot of reasons unless you really go into the methods. And even then it can be hard. And mm -hmm. then there's always the question of what hasn't been. Right. Yeah, the, the, so those the, are the big, oh, sorry, sorry. What were you saying? Well, and there's and like lack of transparency. There's a lot of ways in which savvy academics can hide, uh, you know, uh, like critical points about their data, whether it's in supplementary uh, data 
uh, packets or in footnotes or in the appendices or, you know, they can really bury the lead in a lot of these things as yep. well, which com just, complicates it if, even more. If you don't pre-register, you can just make data you don't like disappear. Like yeah. you can't, um, you like, I'll put it this way. I know of some very, very, very consequential studies onto what just called social justice related issues mm -hmm. where the paper had um, about a little bit less than 10 hypotheses that it had proposed um when it got published it had two left there was barely a positive result for those two and the six that went missing nobody knows what happened to them and when people ask hey why why didn't you publish your results for the other six things you looked into they won't answer the questions for it you can just make those disappear if you don't get the data you want i can't yeah. say that's what happened but right. that's the only logical explanation I can think of outside of uh, very, very, very high levels of stupidity or incompetence. Right. And then the other problem is volume and time. Like the people interested in exploring those and like getting into the weeds on these things that don't have the same uh, incentives as the people doing the research. It's like far and few between. And it's like they can, it's like, they can, it's sort of like the misinformation sort of like uh thing. It's like, I can say 10 false things and for you to correct each false thing, it's going to take you 10 hours, but it only took me 10 minutes to say 10 things that were wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. That also, that reminds me, this might be a good ending note, but mm -hmm. um, just on the topic of misinformation, if I had to think of a poster child for fake academic field, misinformation studies might be the number one. Oh my God, misinformation studies. It is <laughs> unfathomably bad. Oh gosh, yeah. I didn't even know that was an area of study, to be honest with you. I just thought it was like a ancillary topic to some other social science field, but that would be interesting to get into, um, you know, that field in general and just see, and just see, I mean, it, it's so, it would be so ironic and just like a real twist of fate if the, the you know, the field dedicated to studying misinformation was just so vastly wrong about everything that they, <laughs> that they studied and, would, and yeah. I would say that if I had to pick a field, a major field that has some social influence, I would say that misinformation studies might produce the most misinformation of any major field wow. in the social science. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah. To the degree that it actually impacts the way certain important figures view the world and think about how misinformation works, that might be the number one, because it's just, it's not that consequential. But right. it's just, wow, this is, this information is so bad that it's actually, what it, the irony is palpable. Yeah, that's funny. Okay, um, yeah, so I think we got, I mean, those are, I, I think those are going to be awesome to talk about in like future episodes for sure, because I think, yeah, that's a lot of stuff I'm interested in, and, and I think it's unique enough that most people might find it interesting as well. So, yeah, cool. All right. Well, any other like final thoughts you have about the whole situation? I mean, we talked a lot about coalitions, violence, uh, rules of engagement, games for democracy, uh, 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 institutions and in, in the way that they oh, sort Nazi of philosophers, Nazi philosophers. Don't forget about that. We got not, yeah, we did. We did talk about that. That was very yeah, early on. Nazi philosophers, Hitler. Uh, yeah. Um, um, it, it, then I guess this will be yeah. This is the last one I got. Is uh, have you ever seen that that the little Wojak meme where it's got the the eighty IQ, the hundred IQ, and the one twenty IQ guys? Yeah, yeah. And the eighty IQ and the one twenty, they're the same. Yeah, yeah. That's political violence. Political violence, bad. Yeah, this yeah. Eighty IQs and one twenty <laughs> IQs unite. Political violence, bad. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I I can see that. Yeah, it's the that bell curve. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, I, I think yeah. we agree. Hey, everyone. Cool. See ya.